for the week of Teresa Corley, which means I'm going to do a question and answer session. I'm going to look at my videos that I posted on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday and go to your questions and comments and see what we can come up with. All right. RetroFan51, does the family have access to the autopsy since it's still an open case? Uh, no, they don't have access to it um, it's something that they certainly would want access to to confirm the quaaludes and eggs um, story if you will but they don't have it and I don't see anybody giving it up anytime soon the mall why 128 I like the breakdown of each case per week but gosh it's hard to wait for the next episode sometimes <laughs> Hey, I'm sorry about that, you know, but uh, it's a format that seems to work and everybody seems to like it. And I think it will be tweaked here and there as we go forward. Um, you know, when I start going out on scene, maybe we'll have a day that I'm on scene, so on and so forth. So just bear with us as we continue to do what we do. Possibly one or two of the guys from the apartment building went looking for her. I concur with that possibility. They would have had enough time to start to worry whether she was going to talk or not. Finding her close to the police station may have made them try to convince her that they just wanted to see she got home. They were sorry, yada yada. Yes, I think it's possible, even likely, that they would have sexually assaulted her again. It already showed that they had no regard for her as a human being. Everything you state there, Raven, is probably true and correct. It's what I believe um, could have happened. So, certainly. The only problem I have with that, and I stated this before, is would she get in the vehicle again after being sexually assaulted? I don't know. Now, I just got an email and last night that stated there was a couple. One was a transcribed phone call that the sister Jerry had with Steve, who was one of the people at the Presidential Arms. Um, he stated that the gentleman Dave did sexually assault Teresa and he was the one that went looking for her. Now if you remember, Steve is the one who allegedly had a scratch on his face and also that lived out of town, from what I understand, north of where the body dump location is. And remember, I thought that th that was a very important part of this assessment, is that body dump location being on 495. And I felt that at the time of day, six o'clock in the morning, turning daylight, people coming to work, 
you pull off at the first spot that you can where the guardrail breaks and allows you to pull off of the main interstate and a truck driver a truck a semi truck would block most of anything that's happening that you could take a body and drag it down to where it was and then head out of town I always felt and I still feel there has to be a reason to get up on the 495 a major interstate where if you're in town and you're familiar with that area you have a river there you have a lot of woods why get up on the interstate unless you have to and you're heading out of town that's the part that leads me to believe a truck driver from Maria's not saying that happened because obviously the incident at the presidential arms has precedent what kind of luck does a girl have to be sexually assaulted, to hitchhike all the way home, cold, rainy, and then get picked up by a serial killer, those odds are astronomical. Common sense will tell you that it was somebody from the presidential arms. But thinking outside the box and looking at the evidence the ligature, the body dump location, Maria's, eggs and quaalude, that all steers you, steers me, towards maybe, you can't classify it as a serial killer, you don't know if they killed before, if they use a ligature and they're sexual sadist, you would think, but maybe not. Maybe an opportunistic type of murder took place, unrelated to the presidential arms involving a trucker or somebody getting up on the interstate. I think the odds are against that, but it's it's a possibility. And you have to keep that lane open for interpretation. Enough preaching. Gene C, these old cases are very interesting to look at. It takes you back to the old school ways of investigating a case prior to our modern day digital forensics. Having lived as a young person in the 70s and 80s, it brings you back in time to visualize the way things used to be. For example, hitchhiking was very common during that time when she was murdered. Can't wait for the deep dive. Yes, Gene, you're absolutely right. And I think that's important to remember. Uh, there was a couple comments, you know, were there cameras at the restaurant? Come on. You know, it's 1978. So, you're right. And hitchhiking. Hitchhiking was the favorite, uh, favorite pastime for the hunters called serial killers back in the 70s, without a doubt. It's almost like a drive through at McDonald's for serial killers. Pull alongside, give them a ride. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, sad. Did I just say that? Lemon peasy. <sighs> Folks, it's early in the morning here. It's very early. I'm sorry. Dinner is the key to the resolution of this case. This is from Will. It may be the key to the resolution of many others too. I know how very rare serial, serial murder is and the chances of two unrelated crazy events that night, but the method of killing, I just can't shake that off. Well, that's where I'm at. This wasn't a juvenile type unorganized crime scene in my mind. Well, I'll stop you there, Will, and saying we don't have a crime scene. We have a body dump location possible but not probable that that's the crime scene this was a very calm cool sick individual the drugs I believe may be dosed to her at the party especially her needing to go lay down in a bedroom at a place she's uncomfortable laying down makes you defenseless in a way you wouldn't want to do this if you were uncomfortable if you were drugged and slipping unconscious then you would yeah you know I would concur with the second half of your your comment there 
being very drunk, possibly being drugged. Yes, I think maybe she probably did go in that bedroom to lay down. But again, she's uncom uncomfortable there. She had to have been. So, but when she left in a panic and has two mismatching shoes, that's somebody that's not taking their time to leave. Think about, put yourself in a situation where you're at a party, it's time to go, you want to leave, you go to the door where your shoes are, and that's assuming that you took your shoes off at the door. Her shoes could have been taken off, and, th and this is why m minuscule things are important. If I would interview interviewed the people at the presidential arms department, I would have asked, very first question, well, when you got there, what did you do? Well, we walked into the kitchen and got a beer. Wait, wait, before that, um, nothing that I know of. Why? Did you take off your shoes? No. Was that a common thing? They don't know why you're asking that question, but you know as an investigator. And so you want to get that out front before they start putting two two together. And if they say no, and the homeowner and people that have been to that apartment said, no, we never took off our shoes. That's not, wasn't a prerequisite of coming into the house. Then you know she took off her shoes in the bedroom. And the only reason you take your shoes off in the bedroom is to go to sleep or to have some sort of sexual intercourse for the jeans to come off. So I would want to know that. Um, but again, going back to if you're at a party and you're putting your je your shoes on, I can imagine they're not by the door. They don't seem like the type of people to me that would be worried about taking off their shoes before coming into an apartment, which leads me to believe that her shoes were in a bedroom. It's dark. You're not turning on the light for whatever reason and the shoes are mismatched it has to be the level of intoxication the lack of light and the sense of urgency to get out of the room I believe that those are the three indicators as to why she has mismatching shoes on. But that leads to something else, right? That leads to if they did not take their shoes off at the door and it was in the bedroom, how many different shoes were taken off in that bedroom? At least two, at least Teresa's and somebody else's, right? Just was thinking of something else there. It always happens. Marla Robinson. Ken is so damn consistent with videos. I love it. I think this was a quick kill, no captivity. Just a gut feeling, drunk with a bunch of guys. No way that spells possible trouble. Well, Marla, I am consistent with videos because that's what you guys deserve. I treat this as my job. So you expect a video every day, Monday through Friday, and that's what I give you. Uh, especially my members, you know, you are loyal to me. In turn, I'm going to be loyal to you and do the best job and deliver the best content that I can. Cracker Dan, sorry to disrespect your guts, but I think we need a bit more than that to go on. See, Cracker Dan, this is the problem that I have. Although you're you're probably right we need more to go on but just because somebody comments that that's their gut you don't have to be disrespectful towards the person in your comments and that's what you did I mean that was condescending now it's very hard to read into language written language as to mood and character and the way it's to be perceived versus the way it's written. But that's the way that I write it. Um, now Marla went on to say, I'm not saying I am a sleuth. It was just my opinion. And then Cracker Dan comes back and says, sorry. 
Fair enough. I'm going to let it go. Saga. Sometimes bodies are dumped nude along public roads as a statement of disrespect to shame or punish the victim even after death. Think Alexis Sharkey. In this case, I would wonder about the boyfriend who might have been angry that Mrs. Corley left him to proceed on her own to the party where she either had consensual or forced sexual activity with one or several men of, other than himself. Maybe he caught up with her that morning. Strangulation is personal. Did the boyfriend or party assailants know the police officer who was first on the scene of the body discovery site? Did either of the truck drivers? Okay, let me try to break down Saga. Sometimes bodies are dumped nude along public highways as a statement of disrespect. Um, I guess that's true. To shame or punish the victim even after death. Uh, yes and no. A lot of times, and most of the times, they're dumped along the road, down in a gully, off the side of the road, is to get rid of the body as quick as possible. Now, if the body was posed, then that's different. That's a sign of shame, punishment, disrespect. Yeah, I'll get that. But just because they're thrown along the road, that's a matter of convenience and not a statement of disrespect. I wonder if the boyfriend was angry at Mrs. Cor Miss Corley and proceeded on her own to the party. Um, yeah, he was probably upset, but he was talking to another girl, from what I understand. Uh, maybe he caught up with her that morning. Sure, it's possible. Strangulation is personal. Uh, yeah, but it's also a weapon of opportunity. This wasn't strangulation with hands. This was ligature, and that's important to remember. Um, that's either, to me, a weapon of opportunity or planned. Did the boyfriend or party assailants know the police officer who was first on the scene? I don't think so. Did either of the truck drivers? I don't think so. Okay. Ken, here is some info. This is from Katie Hess. That goes to some of the key points you made. One, listen to a recent podcast where Teresa's sister was the guest. She said that her mother had attached the autopsy report to the front of the fridge. And that day, the mother, sister, and brother would often look at it. She was adamant during the podcast that the report said eggs and quaaludes. I know. Like I said, Teresa's sister hired me as, to look into this case five years ago. So I was aware of the quaaludes and eggs story and that's why I brought it up Donna I have a big question it was stated that when Teresa was found she had two different shoes I talked about that extensively did the other one come from the apartments yes I said that was that looked into all the boys at the apartments did anybody have a match yes Think she had eggs that morning at Maria's restaurant. Oh, that was my assumption as well. Christy, you said yesterday that it was a thin ligature that was her cause of death. Wouldn't that more than likely be a garrot? If so, that makes it seem like an experienced killer did it. Well, it could be a garrot. It could be a shoelace. You know, anything, any thin ligature... Um, could be used you know so it doesn't have to be a garage no Katie Hess again Teresa's sister said that Steve one of the alleged at the presidential arms party went to the garden apartments where Teresa's boyfriend happened to live the sister knows this because Teresa's boyfriend heard Steve talking to someone. She thinks he went there to see if Teresa had possibly gone to her boyfriend's. So it does seem like they were already looking for her. I think based on my research, they caught up with her in the short window after she left the restaurant. Very possible, if not probable. It's heartbreaking to know she was so close to home. That could have been me. Not the exact details. Young, dumb and trusting. 
Yeah, I think we all were when we were when we were young. Peg, I think it's more important where the quaaludes in her system came from. Was it fully digested? Don't know because we don't have the autopsy report. Was there any tablet remnants left in her stomach, or was it powder put in her eggs? We don't know that. It takes two to four hours to digest the food that gives you the approximately two hour window if the food wasn't digested. She didn't do drugs, so it is suspicious to find them anywhere in her system. Another question is how many quaaludes were in her stomach and in her system? Sorry, Mr. Maines, these are just rambling questions in my head. You don't have to apologize. Um, I understand your questions and we just don't have those answers. I'm sure the police have those answers and they are not releasing that information. Mail from Gina. I'm watching this for the second time. This is just a great channel. I'm so happy and proud to be a part of the community. Thanks everyone and of course the man, Detective Maine. Salute. Well Gina, mm, I salute you back. Thank you for the compliment. Thank you for being a part of everything. I, I appreciate it. Michael Mysterious. I am captivated by Detective Maines' vibes and professionalism. Thank you, Michael Mysterious. Uh, I don't know about the vibes, but I try to be professional. Uh, I think that's lacking in a lot of YouTube type of true crime stuff. So, hey, that's the only way I know to be. Uh, that's the way I've been my whole career is you, you got to be professional, especially in the career of being a detective or a police officer. That's what the public expects from you. And it just goes back to being a decent human being. Treat others as you'd want to be treated yourself. I mean, the golden rule. It's the golden for a reason. So, but thank you. On the night of morning of Teresa's disappearance, it would have been very cold. December 5th, 1978, a low of 27 degrees in Boston. So easily in the low 20s or colder outside of the city and still dark at 5 a.m. Sunrise was at 7.05. She was approximately half a mile from her house. Close enough to walk, but also close enough to home that she may have felt safe getting a ride from a stranger for a short distance. Oh, that is true, Buzzy. I got gotcha. you. Christina W. Wow, I feel like I should make a flow chart of possible suspects. Counting the hours for the deep dive, Ken. Well, Christina, there's a lot of suspects, but not as many as I've had in other cases. You have probably four or five from the presidential arms, and then... Then it opens up. Because if it isn't them, then you're looking for, in my opinion, probably a sexual sadist that's using a ligature. It's probably a truck driver. Probably was in the vicinity of Maria's restaurant at 5.30 in the morning. One or the other. So, yeah. Like I said, if, if I was the investigator, and this is important, if you take anything away... From what I say here today, it's this. Presidential arms. Five suspects. Let's just say four or five. I'm not sure. Let's go with five. Where do they live? Where would they go after a night of partying at 6.30 in the morning? If your answer, any one of them, is north on 495... You're circling that guy, and he's the first guy I'm talking to, okay? That body dump location, to me, is your only clue right now that we can go on. Because we, we can't go off of the quaaludes and eggs. Not 100%. I'm 99%. I'm 100% sure the family believes they saw that. And I'm 99% sure they probably did. But... Until I had that autopsy report in my hand and I seen it, I'm not going to b believe the eggs and quaalude 100%. I believe it 99, but not 100. So until then, this one suspect, if one of them lives north on 495, he's who I'm talking to. And I believe one of them do. And I think it may have been the Steve who had the scratch on his face. So, I mean, it, it could be that simple. It doesn't have to be all convoluted into a serial killer and a sexual sadist. It doesn't have to be that. Follow the evidence. If Steve lives 
north of 495 as Steve had a scratch on his face. Put it together. Follow it up. These cases just get sadder and sadder. I can't help but wonder if the boys who were with her at the party beforehand went looking to keep her quiet. Uh, well, that would be the reason to me. That would be the reason. B.M. Adina, do we know what was the reason the boys went after the girl? I would be interested to know if they explained that. Because if they didn't do anything suspicious, they must have had some normal explanation. I don't believe they ever said to police that they went looking for her. And the reason they would go looking for her is because, hey, we just raped this girl. We can't allow her to ruin our lives, so we need to go find her. And then they silenced the problem. That's why they would go looking for her. Nate D, I wonder if the investigators canvassed the Dairy Queen and restaurant and at least asked the employees if she was seen or came in for service. Seems like a good place to start, even if the egg story is false. Edit. Okay, so you kind of covered. But my point still stands that she was dropped off there. That's where you would start asking questions. Agreed. Another possibility of the eggs. This is from Robert McFall. One of the truck drivers on their way to work stopped and got a to-go meal and gave her some, but the timeline suggests that she probably did go to the restaurant or even the bar. We all know how hungry you get after a night of drinking. True, but I doubt she's eating eggs at the bar. But that would be easy to determine. And it would be easy to determine if the truck driver gave her eggs, you would ask the truck driver. Because... They were interviewed. That's how we got this information that Teresa was picked up by two different Gaelic farm truck drivers. It's because they were interviewed. So you would ask them. Did they ask them that? I don't know. I think the answer lies with the guys that assaulted her. She had a very bad night, I would say. As a woman, she would just want to go home to bed, take a shower, sleep. I agree with that. Ken, do you know who discovered her body? I watched this news piece and the info about the man who discovered her body and the info about the now deceased man who asked about whether she had been found. Interesting. Yes, okay, so this is a key aspect of it as well. A guy named John Burlington called police and said, I saw a body and described where it was off of 495. He didn't want to give any more information. He said he stopped to relieve himself, which I believe could be credible because, again, the guardrail on 495 and where Teresa's body was found is the first pull-off when you come from out of town or from um, Birmingham when you get up on... 495. You have guardrails there, and then the first place you can turn off where the guardrails are no longer, you would use that to urinate. Whether he did or not, I don't know. But he certainly couldn't call from the scene. No cell phones, so he had to drive home. Again, one of the suspects, I believe, lived in Burlington, so it seemed like a made-up name. People alleged that the person who made that call was Ronnie. The dispatcher who took the call says he knows Ronnie and he knows his voice and that was him. And then Ronnie shows up at the police station where I guess his relative, maybe his father, worked and said, hey, you know, what's going on with his body that you found? But yet it didn't go out to anybody. I can't confirm that. Now when I did my assessment in my report in 2016 and gave it to the Corley family, I did a section in there about that where it was more detailed and uh, I just don't recall exactly the details of what I found out and put in that report. But yeah, it's certainly, you know, a lot of times people will do that. I'll give you an example. In my Gail Matthews murder, the boyfriend of Gail Matthews never called her place of employment ever before. 
He had only been her boyfriend for, you know, I don't know, six, seven months. If that. But it never called her place of employment. The day that she died and before her body's found, he called three times. Now, in my training and my experience, I'm going to say the reason for that is because there's remorse. And one, he wants her to be found. And then when he is questioned, he's going to say, well, I didn't do it. I was calling her. I was calling her at work. Essentially giving himself an alibi. So that could very well translate to this. But then why use an anonymous name? I believe they looked up and they couldn't find anybody named John Burlington from around that area and could not contact him anymore. So, how long can you tell exactly what a person ate after digestion started? Because the fact that eggs were found in the digestive system is pretty specific information, if it's true. I don't have an answer for that. I'm not a forensic pathologist. I'm not a doctor. Um, so, again, when I don't know something, I don't, I don't try to speculate. I stay in my lane. MF, what is the proof that the second driver left her at the police station and didn't go to the restaurant? Well, I don't know whether that's true or not. I know that the second driver was interviewed. That's all I know, and apparently what he said. Being left on the highway a lot of times is a trucker, but she didn't need a ride anymore. Could a neighbor have offered her eggs and drugged her, then dumped her body before daylight? I guess that's possible. I would question the police officer that was first on the scene. Also, the guy who called it in and gave a fake name. Sounds like a young man. Well, I believe that they have. You know, police officer first on scene. He was spoke to many times after the years, but I think his memory, he's older and his memory has faded because his story contradicts. Now, just because his story contradicts, don't jump on that and say, well, he's the guy that did it. Come on. I am betting that poor girl ran from what happened at the party and a guy or guys tracked her down in fear of making a police report. Mike Half Moon's Mall. I think you're probably 100% um, right. Like I said, it's one or the other. So, how far was her workplace? This is from Aunt Penny. I know a lot of people will stop for breakfast or coffee if they work an early shift. Maybe she saw someone from her job, felt comfortable. It would tie in with the ligature marks. And that is, yes, you're right. Um, it could be completely coincidental that she was killed with a ligature and she worked at a manufacturing plant that made that type of um, ligature. But again, it's something that has to be looked into, right? You have to be able to look into that and, you know, it's it's possible what you're the scenario that you're presenting it's possible and what if what if then it strikes as a crime of opportunity she's drunk she's woozy and they decide to take advantage of that again man the astronomical statistical realm of her being raped basically gang raped by four or five guys being drugged with quaaludes and then meeting her demise five minutes from being home by a completely different person or set of persons what's the odds of that I don't know I, again if I don't know I don't know I can only offer my insight. I'm not a psychic. But I could probably give you just about as good information as a psychic can. <laughs> because they don't know any more than I do. My opinion. Love the shirt. Waylon. Great taste of music. Thank you for saying that. Waylon Jennings, my all-time favorite country music uh, artist. And now I just started listening to his 
grandson, Way Jennings, who sounds just like him. Ann Reedy, getting bright at 5.30 in the morning, middle of winter. Sure, the guys car pulling to work thought they saw her, but they could have been anyone, including her. Did she have money with her? If not, who took her to the restaurant, fed and drugged her, and managed to take her away without being seen? If the restaurant staff not talking? I don't know. Don't have answers to any of that, other than she was seen by three guys that were carpooling that put her in front of the Dairy Queen, which was almost to her house. Could they have been mistaken and seen somebody else? I guess, but it seems like it was around her way of travel. So I would have to know what exactly they saw. Did she have money with her? I don't know. I don't know if she had a purse with her. But, hey, I'm seeing, am I seeing a little bit of sunbeams coming through here? Again, on this very cold and overcast day? Man, I might have Teresa. I'm going to enjoy this for a moment, just like I always do. Anytime I get those rays of sunbeam coming in on me. Uh, maybe that's Teresa just saying thank you. Here I'm saying that I don't believe in psychics at all. And then I say that maybe these sunbeams are Teresa. Hey, I can believe what I want to believe. So, thank you, Teresa. Was there actual proof she was dropped off at the location? Camera footage from the police station. Christina, I don't think there is any camera footage back in 1978, even it being a police station. I would think the mismatched shoe would have DNA all over it. Well, what Tanya, what type of DNA are you talking about? If you're talking touch DNA, what would it prove? We already know that the shoe came from the party, and I think they already identified who the shoe came from. So DNA is not even relevant. It is known for sure that the restaurant was open at 5 a.m. question mark. That seems a bit early. Yes, that's it was confirmed. Was there anyone at the party who worked at Penthouse 2? I, I don't know the answer to that. Man, look at those sunbeams coming in. Man, it's it's the when you get older, it's the little things that you look for in beauty. I would like to know who worked at that restaurant. If she was found a half mile from home, which is six blocks, makes me think somebody close to home saw her and took advantage of the situation. Somebody she knew her whole life. It's a good possibility. But you got you got to remember, I don't know. I have a hard time with 5.30 in the morning, 6 o'clock in the morning, somebody deciding to rape and kill somebody in the spur of the moment. I know it happens at all times. But I just have a hard time with it personally. Mary Kidd, maybe the guys came back and got her the prick who said her that they thought she's going to go to the cops. They went to find her. Well, that seems to be the consensus. Diane Wingate, were the eggs scrambled, fried, hard boiled, or deviled? I don't think there's any way to determine that, Diane. When you eat and you start to digest food, I don't think you're going to be able to tell whether they were scrambled, hard-boiled, deviled. Uh, but even if, why would that matter? Goldie Kahn, the lewds were in her stomach, question mark. Well, that's what... I'm told from the autopsy report. Tina Lachie. My name is Teresa Corley. Wow, how weird. That is weird. And it's weird how these sunbeams are just beaming on me now. Wow. Mary Kidd again. Were the drugs in the eggs? No idea. No way to determine that. 
Okay. Now all those questions were from the key clue video. I'm going to go to the deep dive video and see if there's any different ones. Kelly Jansen, wow, what a tough, sad case. She unfortunately got herself into a terrible situation by going to the presidential arms. I think it's one of the guys from the presidential arms, but the eggs just throw me off. Thank you for this one. You are my favorite. Well, thank you, Kelly. I appreciate that. And you, you are portraying the exact scenario and situation and feelings that I feel. Um, that it seems like it's presidential arms, but the eggs are throwing me off as well. But it could be both, right? It could be both. Maybe she did go to Maria's restaurant. And maybe she did eat the eggs. And maybe she did leave the restaurant and start walk, walking up towards Dairy Queen where she's seen by the three people carpooling. And after they pass, somebody from the presidential arms picks her up and, and kills her. Good possibility. So it could be both. I have a feeling this girl wasn't taken to the police by the truck driver. I think he took her to the restaurant because he knew the place. I know we are all different, but if that had happened to me, my first thought would not have been a complaint, but to be with my mom, family as soon as possible. And that's true. I mean, the, the truck driver would have to be questioned as to, hey, why did you drop her off where you did? And I'm sure the police have that. They interviewed the guy. So I guarantee they have that information. We just we just don't know it. Rain eighty eight. Just one note. You mentioned that Teresa might have been hesitant to go into the police station because she had been drinking underage. Actually, the minimum drinking age in Massachusetts in nineteen seventy eight was eighteen, so she was legal. They raised the drinking age to 18 just a couple months after her death, February 1979. Rainy, thank you. I did not know that. That's good info. So I guess my reasoning for her not going, possibly going into the police station, is faulty. So I would correct that. But she still may have been embarrassed, and I said that in the earlier video as well. Maybe that's the reason. Or maybe she had no intention of reporting the assault. It's amazing how you carry the destiny of people in your heart. Unique. I wish the family perseverance, and I hope one day a video will be made of the perpetrator being captured. I hope that as well. Sarek the Great. If the undigested eggs evidence is true, my bet is that she ate at the restaurant, left it, or tries to leave, and was kidnapped between the restaurant and her place, which was nearby. Just my two cents. Another great video. And I think I just kind of went over that scenario. Laura Mead. Here's a couple questions I have. Was there any other injuries besides the strangulation? I don't know. That's the only information that I have. I'd be interested to see if it was overkill or not. I, I don't believe so. I think it was just strictly strangulation. Whether it was defensive, there wasn't stab wounds or gunshot wounds from what I understand. It's just strangulation. Are you? Sh are they sure that she died early that AM or not later on? No. I don't think that's been determined. I feel like if it was one of the guys from the party, someone would have let it slip by now. Well, and I think they kind of did. I got an email from a lady who said... She was best, her husband was best friends with a guy named, I want to say Larry, who was at the presidential arms apartment that night in question. Larry told him that they, all the guys, Ronnie and another guy held her down while the rest of the guys raped her. So she said she gave that information to the police, but they just didn't seem like they were interested in it. I don't know the truth to it. I'm just telling you what was reported to me. To me, it matches. Kind of makes sense. So. Leah Icurd. 
I agree with your assessment that she was murdered by someone unknown to her. The fact that her body was dumped off a major interstate with very little effort to conceal the body says that the offender was not worried about the body being found because there was no way to link the offender to the body. A known offender would have made more of an effort to hide the body. I'm with you all the way up and agree with you all the way up until the last sentence. A known offender would have made more of an effort to hide her body. Although that may be true, that's not the truth in every sense. So I, I do like your way of thinking there and I tend to agree with you. Bridget Harrison, you just taught me something that I that will help me in Jason DeMello case. If someone says something and you can't find anyone to back that up, put it aside. You can't use it. Well, yes, put it aside. You, you can follow up on it if there's something there to follow up on. Um, but if no one else corroborates it, you have to put it on the back burner. You can't discard it completely. Just put it on the back burner until you can corroborate it. Just as blessed. I have a 19-year-old daughter myself and cannot even fathom something like this happening to her. This poor family. May they find answers and resolution someday. Thank you, Detective Maines. I agree. S. Fiddler. Possibly a delivery truck driver who supplies her work. She would feel comfortable in accepting a ride because she had a small talk with him at work or the guy who couldn't get it up. I guess he finally got it up as he was strangling her. I agree with your deductions. Jenna, can you truly have a mind for detail and making reasonable connections? So cool how you brought up fo both face scratch stories here. Well, yeah, and I, I do that a lot. I try to, each case, if there's something that is relevant or not identical but similar to another case, you know, I think of both of them. So in this case, Greg Emmel being scratched and him saying well, it was from a flat tire and it got scratched by a jagger bush when I knew that was complete bullshit, that it was the victim that scratched him, I would make the same logical conclusion in this case. The fact that the individual stated that he was having sex with Teresa Corley, she had an orgasm and scratched his face. Not only does that speak to a narcissistic personality um, who's telling the story, it's just, I don't want to get too personal, but I will say I've been in a situation multiple times, hopefully, if it wasn't being faked, and you know how many times I got scratched in the face? Zero. I call bullshit and he's would be circled in my suspect pool and he's who I'd be talking to again I'm going off of okay my limited experience in that realm or maybe vast amount of experience <laughs> I told you it was early in the morning Perplexing case. I agree with all your observations, Detective. Thank you. My daughter lives in Bellingham now, so this case really intrigues me. I'd love to see this solved. Also, just remember this. And I've said this many times. It's not what you know, it's what you can prove. That's so very important. And that's from Denzel Washington, Training Day. When I was a detective... And even when I was a patrol cop, one of the best piece of advices that I got was work the case backwards. And I always did that. And what that means is if you're on scene, start thinking right away about trial. So think about what could be suppressed if, you, okay, let's say you see, you see a safe there. And you think more than likely a murder weapon is in that safe. You have a search warrant already for the property. So you're like, well, the safe's here. Let's open it up. But if you work backwards from the trial, you'll know that anything you get from that safe will be suppressed because 
although you have a search warrant for the entire house, you have to have a separate search warrant for the contents of that safe. So when you work it backwards, while you're there on the scene, now you know, hey, I got to go get a second search warrant. That's what it is to work it backwards. And so they may have this solved. They may know in their minds who did it. They may not have enough evidence. Maybe not. But a lot of cases are solved. It's just not what you know. It's what you can prove. MF. The last trucker may have lied about dropping her off at the police station unless there is video on it. Well, there's not going to be video on it. Um, in the 1978. That's just not happening. But the guy was interviewed. So I think the police, on everything must have matched up. Or he certainly would be a major suspect. Could she, he have lied about dropping her off at the police station? I guess he could. RR, that was an excellent assessment. Thank you. Well, thank you for watching, RR. Uh, did she have money, purse, on her to buy food? Unknown. If not, that could rule out the restaurant unless she was offered a meal. The mismatched shoes could be from putting them on in the dark, and the extra four hours may be her waiting for the men to fall asleep. They weren't allowing her to leave. Her only way home is to walk. That's a good possibility. You know, what's funny is I think, and now that I'm thinking about that, these sunbeams come in. I, I don't get them on any other day. It's the question and answer period, if, I, if I'm remembering right, because this has happened like three weeks in a row now, maybe four. I don't know why I'm all caught up on these sunbeams, because I am. It makes me happy. But it only happens on the question and answer period, I think. Weird. Hope and Jazz. One man lied about his inability to perform sexually. One man had a scratch on his face. Ronnie was on the brink of telling what he knew. Her comment of what she would do to be free to go. Looks like she was drugged and held against her will. Different shoes could point to her sneaking out in the dark with haste. All that's true. All that's true. All right, this is the last one here. My only question is, where did the Quaaludes come in? Someone must know. I think she probably ate somewhere just to get something in her stomach and warm up. I agree with your conclusion, but I think those Quaaludes are important to the case. And I think David did it so she wouldn't talk. Why else would he lie? Well, Peg, you're absolutely right. The Quaaludes hold a, a very key um, aspect to this case. We don't know where they came from. That's one of the questions like we have in many uh, cases, unfortunately. It's one of two things. She, you know, she was given those quaaludes, you know, without her knowledge or her consent because they were like a date rape drug. Or she took them. You can't rule that out. As much as you want to rule that out, her victimology tells you you should probably rule that out because she had only smoked marijuana to that point that we know about. However, being in her intoxicated state that she was does not mean that she would not take them willingly. So you have to take that in consideration. You can't automatically just assume that she was date raped with drugs, given date rape drugs, I should say. You can't assume that because you don't know. So you just have to look at the fact. And the fact, if true, she had quaaludes in her system. We don't know how they got there. You can surmise from here to Sunday. It doesn't make it true. All right. That's it for the questions and answers for Teresa Corley. I hope 
this helped out the family a little bit. Uh, that's my hope in all these cases is that it shines some light on the case for the victims and the victims' families. I almost end every video that way because that's what it's always about. Always about that. Make no mistake about it. It's always, always about the victim and the victim's families. So with that, I salute the victim and the victim's families. And they have my deepest, deepest condolences and respect. So until uh, next week, Maine's out.